Sambunani, Aman Kan Bam. Good morning, Kuyamore. Hello, and welcome to today's video. We're going to be breaking down osteoporosis with a couple of dad jokes first. What happens if you were to boil your funny bone? Well, you end up making a laughing stock of yourself. <laughs> and ever thought which bone in the body do you break if you lie too much? It's the fibula. <laughs> Guys, I encourage you to smash that like, share, and subscribe buttons if you enjoy this content. We're going to be talking about osteoporosis in terms of a handy clinical case with some context. And then breaking down, exploring osteoporosis, we've got key points first up, succinctly summarizing what you need to know in a nutshell. Then we're doing an introduction and looking at etiologies, patient presentation, differential diagnosis, diagnostic evaluation in the way of investigative workup, treatment and management strategies, prognosis and complications, and we're going to end off speaking about scripture from the Bible. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you and your family are well. So today we've got a 50-year-old woman who presents to your office to inquire about her risk for fracture related to osteoporosis. Now, she has a positive family history of osteoporosis in her mother, but her mother never experienced any hip or vertebral fractures. Very important. The patient herself has not also experienced any fractures. She is white, has a 20-pack year history of tobacco use, having quit 10 years prior. At the age of 37, quite young, uh, that's actually my age, <laughs> she had a total hysterectomy and a bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy for endometriosis. She is lactose intolerant and does not consume any dairy products. Mm -hmm. She currently takes calcium carbonate 500 milligrams daily. Her weight is 48 kilograms and her height is 1.54 centimeters. The body mass index of just 19. Now, all of the following are risk factors for osteoporotic fracture and this woman with one exception. What is that exception? Is it A, early menopause, B, female sex, C, history of cigarette smoking, D, low body weight, or is it E, low calcium intake? Guys, key points we need to know. Let's get started. Osteoporosis is a progressive metabolic bone disease that decreases bone density. Bone density is basically bone mass per unit volume. Uh, and with the resultant deterioration in bone structure. Skeletal weakness leads to fractures with uh, minor or inapparent trauma, what we call fragility fractures or pathological fractures, particularly in the thoracic and lumbar spine, All right, but also in the neck of femur as well. Diagnosis is by dual energy X-ray absorptionometry DEXA scanning or by confirmation of a fragility fracture. Prevention and treatment involves risk factor modification, calcium and vitamin D supplementation, exercises to maximize bone and muscle strength, improve balance and minimize the risk of falls, and of course, drug therapy to preserve bone mass and stimulate newborn formation. That is osteoporosis in a nutshell. Let's get stuck in, guys. Fasten your seatbelts and put your helmets on. Osteoporosis is characterized by diminished bone, uh, bone mineral density and microarchitectural deterioration of bone tissue, which speaks to poor bone quality. Now, lower peak bone mass and accelerated bone loss after menopause lead to increased risks for osteoporosis among women in comparison with men. In fact, females are affected a whopping six, time, six times more frequently than men. Right? Osteoporotic fractures are associated with significant mortality, morbidity, and of course, economic burden. Now, an, an evaluation for osteoporosis is often overlooked in patients at risk. Every time we see a postmenopausal female, for instance, we should always bear in mind that this patient might have osteoporosis and investigate accordingly. Half of all postmenopausal women will experience an osteoporosis associated fracture. Good for us as clinicians to watch out for this, all right? Let's look at etiology, epidemiology, and risk factors. Let's get this guy down here. Yeah? All right. The WHO, who? <laughs> the World Health Organization, uh, is, you know, the definition of osteoporosis is based off the bone mineral density. To this end, we look at the DEXA score. And the T-score is the number of standard deviations below or above the mean bone mineral density in comparison to young, healthy female adults. We'll compare that to the Z-score just now. So a normal T-score is that which is greater than minus 1. 
low bone mass, which speaks to osteopenia, speaks to a T-score, which is between minus 1, right, but greater than minus 2.5. And osteoporosis, when your T-score tips uh, to minus 2.5 or less. Severe or established osteoporosis means that you have a T-score of minus 2.5 or less with at least one fragility fracture. Now, osteoporosis has been traditionally classified as type 1, 2, and 3. Type 1 classically occurs in a postmenopausal female, and osteoporosis is attributed to gonadal deficiency, example, lack of uh, estrogen. Uh, and in male's testosterone, right? Type 2 is what we term senile osteoporosis, which is due to poor bone formation or diminished renal vitamin D3, cholecalciferol, right? But uh, type 3 is a result of medications like steroids. Uh, patients who take steroids chronically, be it for sarcoidosis, for asthma, for granulomatous conditions, for immunosuppression, for whatever reason, or other causes of increased bone loss. Now, in comparison to the T-score, the Z-score compares a patient's bone mineral density to the average values of a person of the same age and gender, whereas the T-score uh, refers to the number of standard deviations below or above the bone mineral density in comparison to a young, healthy female adult, okay? So non-modifiable risk factors for osteoporosis include your age, because you chose your parents poorly, <laughs> female gender, Caucasian or Asian race, a relatively small body frame, your body habitus, your family history, surgical menopause, hypothyroidism, and hypogonadism. Something you can't change. What you can change in the way of modifiable risk factors includes smoking, alcohol abuse, calcium or vitamin D deficiency, lifetime of inactivity, medications like steroids, anticonvulsants, chemotherapy, lithium, high caffeine intake, and nulliparity. Worldwide, osteoporosis affects about one in three women and the same for men. So here, we this is taken from Harrison's. We're just looking. We're we, we, uh, plotting on our x-axis the age. On the y-axis, the incidence of uh, fracture per 100,000 uh, persons per year, right? And uh, in green, we have collis fracture, right? Um, well, the incidence is more or less the same around the 80s as it is around the 60s. In red, we have vertebral fracture with incidence significantly greater the older you become. But guys, look at hip fracture. The incidence of hip fracture is significantly more postmenopausal compared to premenopausal, right? This is in a different uh, format looking at risk factors for osteoporosis. We talked about non modifiable versus modifiable in terms of uh, osteoporosis fracture. I'm mean, already touched on this, right? Non modifiable being personal history of fracture as an adult, history of fracture in a first degree relative, female gender, advancing age, white race, dementia, and then potentially modifiable risk factors being the key word here is current cigarette smoking, right? Estrogen deficiency in the way of early menopause before the age of 45 years, that's the definition, or bilateral ovariectomy, prolonged premenstrual amenorrhea for over a year, poor nutrition, especially low calcium and vitamin D, alcoholism, impaired eyesight despite adequate correction, recurrent falls, especially in the elderly, inadequate physical activity, poor health and frailty. That's a nice way to uh, remember risk factors, right? So, the mnemonic is access leads to osteoporosis. A is alcohol use, C is corticosteroid use, C speaks to calcium being low, E is estrogen is low, S is smoking, it's a density lifestyle, right? Note the dowager's hump, right, which speaks to uh, thoracic kyphosis because of loss of vertebral height, which is what happens in osteoporotic patients. I must always suspect someone having a vertebral fracture if they have that typical posture, right? What are the factors leading to osteoporotic fractures? This is taken from Harrison's. So, um, aging, menopause, other risk factors leads to increased bony loss. This combined with low peak bone mass contributes to low bone density and increased chance of fractures, uh, which leads to poor bone quality and propensity to fall. Repetitive falls. How do patients present, guys? Vertebral fracture is by and large the most common clinical manifestation of osteoporosis or osteopenia. It's most common in the lower thoracic or lumbar spine, and the initial fracture is often asymptomatic. The patients don't even know they have it, guys. Wrist or hip fractures are the other common areas for osteoporotic fractures. Loss of height of more than one inch, which is about 2.5 centimeters, should raise suspicion for osteoporosis. Thoracic kyphotic posturing, as we've seen in the diagram attached to the mnemonic, is often seen and may be indicative of multiple vertebral fractures. Back pain as well, maybe a harbinger for vertebral compression fractures, may present 
as a suspected finding during orthopedic surgery, often hip surgery. Guys, what's the differential diagnosis for osteoporosis? It could be osteopenia and osteomalacia. Osteomalacia is a bone mineralization. Uh, sorry, sorry, it's, it's, it's a bone matrix problem, right? Lymphoma, uh, no, I said to be created osteomalacia as a mineralization problem, guys. Lymphoma, leukemia, metastatic disease, multiple myeloma, Paget's disease, renal osteodystrophy, hyperparathyroidism, ischemic bone disease, and osteogenesis imperfecta. Okay, let's look at some pathology here, guys, taken from Harrison's. Looking at the, the mechanism here of uh, bone remodeling. So the basic molecular unit um, BMU, there we are, moves along the tubicular surface of bone at a rate of 10 microns per day. The figure depicts remodeling over about 120 days. So first up in picture A, we have origination of the basic molecular unit lining cells, which contracts to exposure collagen and attracts the pre-osteoclast, right? Then in P, we have osteoclast then fused into multinucleated cells. Um, there we have it here. Uh, and uh, that resorb a cavity. So, you know, the claim to fame of the osteoclasts is they resorb bone, and the claim to fame of osteoblasts is that they lay down bone, okay, uh, or matrix. Mononuclear cells, continue resorption, and pro-osteoblasts are stimulated to proliferate. In C, we can see the osteoblasts align at the bottom of the cavity. There we see it here. And start forming osteoid, which is black. Osteoid is uh, organic bony matrix, okay. In D, we see that the osteoblasts continue formation and mineralization. Uh, previous osteoid starts to mineralize. This is the pink portion speaking to the mineralization, right? In E, the osteoblasts begin to flatten, and in F, the osteoblasts then turn into lining cells. Bony remodeling at the initial surface, which is the left of the drawing, is now complete, all right? So this is a beautiful diagram demonstrating for us hormonal control of bony resorption. So in A, we're looking at the pre, uh, pro-resorptive and calcitropic factors, which includes things like 1,25 dihydroxy vitamin D3, uh, parathyroid hormone, parathyroid hormone later protein, prostaglandin E2, interleukin 1 and 6, tumor necrosis factor, prolactin, corticosteroids, oncostatin. These are pre-resorptive and calcitropic factors, right, which then we see acts on the osteoblast or bone marrow stromal cells, right? And as a result, what we're going to have is a variety of processes, right? Activating synovial fibroblasts, activated T lymphocytes and dendritic cells, okay? And we have the activation of colony forming unit granulocyte macrophage, right? Which comes in and activates your pro osteoclast, which then differentiates into multinucleated osteoclast. And we have the activated osteoclast. So we have the laying down of bone and then resorption of bone, right? In B, we have anabolic and anti osteoclastic factors being estrogens, calcitonin, BMP, transforming growth factor, beta, thrombopoietin, interleukin-17, pre growth factor, and calcium, right? And uh, remember, what's uh, depicted here is the red kind of um, uh, diagram that indicates OPG, and the yellow is rank L, which is receptor activator nuclear, uh, nuclear factor kappa lambda, rank L, right? So uh, what happens is that rank L expression is induced in the osteoblast, activated T cells, synovial fibroblasts, and bone metastromal cells, and then binds to the membrane-bound receptor rank to promote osteoclast differentiation, activation, and survival. So what actually activates your osteoclastic resorption is rank or rank L. Conversely, osteoprotegrin, OPG is osteoprotegrin, Expression is induced by factors that block bone catabolism and promote anabolic effects. So OPG, the net effect of OPG, which is uh, osteoprotegrin, is to promote bony formation, and the net effect of rank is bony uh, dissolution via the osteoclastic resorption. OPG binds and neutralizes rank L, leading to a block in osteoclastiogenesis and decreased survival of pre-existing osteoclasts. Alrighty, thank you so much. Guys, here we're looking at diseases associated with the increased risk of generalized osteoporosis in adults. There's a truckload of them. We divide them into hypogonadal states, endocrine disorders, uh, as we see, nutritional and GI disorders, rheumatological disorders, hematological disorders, malignancy, selected, inherited disorders, and other disorders, right? There's a whole lot to mention. 
drugs associated with the increased risk of generalized osteoporosis in adults. So here, what we need to look out for is glucocorticoids, very important, cyclosporin, cytotoxic drugs, some anticonvulsants, aromatase inhibitors, SSRIs, excessive thyroxine, and hyperthyroidism as well does the same. Aluminium, especially in our formulations for we use for reflux, so aluminium containing antacids, gonadotropin releasing hormone agonists, heparin, lithium, PPIs, thiazolidine, diodes, and androgen deprivation therapies. Guys, how are you going to work up someone that you suspect has osteoporosis? Well, decreased bone mass and prior osteoporotic fracture are big predictors of fracture risk. Decreased bone mass as per DEXA bone scan and a history of prior pathological fragility fractures. The National Osteoporosis Foundation of South Africa, NOFSA, recommends bone mineral density testing in all women who are older than 65, women younger than 65 with at least one risk factor, which includes uh, which excludes race, gender, and postmenopausal, right? And any postmenopausal woman who presents with a fracture. Also, in men who present with fracture after minimal trauma, women on hormone replacement therapy for prolonged periods of time, and those with diseases that often cause osteoporosis. Hip and spine DEXA scan is a preferred test for bone mineral density, right? Recommended testing for patients with a fragility fracture or a T-score less than minus 2.5 also include full blood count, urea and electrolytes, calcium magnesium phosphate, albumin, and of course liver function, urinary calcium excretion, if indicated by the hormone level, that is stimulating uh, hormone TSH and 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels. Uh, you want to add a testo level in men. You want to measure your intact parathyroid hormone level in patients who have hypercalcemia, hypercalciuria, osteopenia, or renal stones. Consider celiac disease in cases of unexplained anemia and low vitamin D levels. And to that end, you want to do your anti-gladin, anti-endomycel, anti transcutaminase antibodies. Malignancy should be considered in cases of anemia, weight loss, and hypercalcemia. Urinary N tenopeptide is a marker of bony resorption, generally not indicated given the sensitivity and availability of DEXA scanning. Sorry, and plain films are indicated to assess for fracture and low bone density of the thoracic and lumbar spine, speaking to compression fractures, as, as well as any bony areas which are tender on examination, guys. So this is a typical DEXA scan. Here we're looking at the lumbar spine. I'm using the average of the BMD from L2 through L4, all right? Uh, from L2 to L4. Right, and we can see clearly if your bone mineral density is normal up and to minus 1. Anything between minus 1 uh, and minus 2.5 is regarded as osteopenia. Anything less than minus 2.5 is osteoporosis. So here we're looking at the T scores, right? T score, remember comparing the patient's bone mineral density to um, that of a young female. Okay, and it's not age match. Age match is this score, but a younger, uh, you know, healthy female is a T score. So here we're looking at L spine L2 to L4. All right. So here we're looking at uh, bone mineral density once again L2 to L4 P, which is PA spine. And here we're looking at the neck of femur. Same principle, right? Uh, to determine whether it's in the normal range, osteopenic or osteoporotic range. Okay, now indications for bone mineral density testing, we said uh, women aged above 65, men aged above 70, regardless of clinical risk factors, younger postmenopause women or women in the menopausal transition, and men aged 50 to 69 who do have clinical risk factors for fracture, adults who have had a fracture at or after the age 50, and of course, adults with any predisposing condition, for instance, rheumatoid arthritis, or taking a medication like glucocorticoids at a daily dose of 5 mg period, or equivalent for more than three months. Those are the magic numbers. More than 500 gram pred for more than three months associated with low bone mass or bone loss. Okay, A nice way to predict your uh, fracture risk is by an online calculator called the FRAX calculation tool. The FRAX calculation tool. What this does is you answer the required fields, right? And the calculator then assesses for you your 10-year probability uh, of fracture. Right, ask you a variety of questions like your age, sex, weight, height, previous fracture. You know, if there's a history of uh, a fractured hip in your parents, current smoking, glucocorticoids, much other thyroid, secondary osteoporosis, alcohol intake, femoral neck, bone mineral density, okay, etc. And it computes your 10 year probability of fracture risk. Uh, indications for vertebral testing in the way of vertebral imaging in the following scenario. So let's just get my pen in there. 
All women aged above 70, all men above 80, if bone mineral density, T-score at the spine, total hip or femoral neck, right? Or, the word is or, not and, eh? or is minus 1. Women aged from 65 to 69 and men aged from 70 to 79, if the bone mineral density, T-score at the spine, total hip or femoral neck is the less than 1.5. Postmenopausal women and men aged above 50 with specific risk factors like low trauma fracture during adulthood aged above 50, historical history of uh, height loss of 4 centimeters or more, uh, prospective height loss of 2 centimeters or more, recent or ongoing long term glucocorticoid treatment. Looking at biochemical markers of bone metabolism and clinical use. So, what speaks to bone formation is sedum bone specific alkaline phosphatase, sedum osteocalcin sedum propeptide of type 1 procollagen. What speaks to bony resorption is urine and sedum cross-linked N telepeptide and C telepeptide. Here we see a lateral spine x-ray showing severe osteopenia and a severe wedge-shaped deformity. So we can see this vertebral collapse right, and a severe wedge-shaped deformity which speaks to severe anterior compression giving you the typical thoracic kyphosis. Okay, Guys, how are we going to treat and manage osteoporosis? Nice to ask. Right, so first up, adequate dietary calcium at least 1.5 gram per day and vitamin D supplementation between 4 to 800 international units per day. Ensure adequate physical activity. This is essential, especially weight-bearing activity, physical activity. This helps to, number one, directly increase your bone density. Number two, strengthens your muscles. Number three, improve balance. Number four, prevents falls. Avoid tobacco use, limit alcohol use, reduce caffeine intake, follow a low-sodium diet, right? And they were of medications. So available pharmacological agents include our beloved bisphosphonates, alendronate, risedronate, as well as your selective estrogen receptor modulators, raloxifene, estrogen, calcitonin, parathyroid hormone, and everybody's favorite, the rank L receptor uh, 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 antagonist, which is denosumab. Estrogen supplementation should be used cautiously because it may be associated with increased risk of cancer, as we know, heart attack, stroke, and of course, venous thromboembolism. Bisphosphonates increase bony mass by inhibiting your osteoclast activity, and they reduce the incidence of vertebral and non vertebral fractures significantly by some 30 to 50 percent. Calcitonin reduces the risk of vertebral fractures by up to 20 percent and may also significantly decrease the pain caused by spinal compression fractures. Raloxifene is a selective estrogen receptor module later serum that reduces vertebral fractures by 40%. Testosterone replacement, of course, in men increases bone motor density at the spine. Denosumab is a new kid in the block which inhibits receptor activates a nuclear factor kappa B ligand rank L, which is the protein, as we said, essential for activation and function of osteoclast. So the net effect of denosumab is to inhibit osteoclastic activity. Parathyroid hormone supplementation is the only treatment that stimulates bone formation, however, uh, Safety and efficacy have not been demonstrated beyond two years, okay? So these, in a nutshell, are the drugs we use to treat osteoporosis from the NASA guidelines. So inhibitors of bony resorption, anti-catabolics versus stimulators of bony formation, the anabolics. So anti-catabolics include calcium, vitamin D, estrogen progestins, estrogen analogs, selective estrogen receptor modulators, testosterone, raloxifene, Tibolone, phytoestrogens, testo, and bisphosphonates, you can choose alendronate, ibandronate, risedronate, alendronate, calcitonins. The anabolics include parathyroid hormone, uh, drugs with dual and or complex actions on bone, strontium renolate, vitamin D metabolites, anabolic steroids, and thiazides in dapamide. Side effects of bisphosphonates, guys, very uh, important to know these, especially if you're giving the IV versus the oral formulation. So with oral formulations, GI toxicity, esophageal erosion, stomach upset, you've got to advise the patient, take it first thing in the morning when you wake up, wait for at least two hours before you have breakfast. You must be sitting up for at least 30 minutes to two hours, right? Uh, side effects seen with the parental formulations is the acute phase reaction, renal toxicity, the dreaded one is osteonecrosis of the jaw, transient leukopenia, and bone pain. That which the side effects seen with both oral and parental formulations, skin rash, ocular complications, hypocalcemia, increased PTH levels, atrial fibrillation, altered taste, precipitation of asthma, albeit not that common. Guys, looking at adequate calcium intake, what is recommended, right? In terms of uh, adolescents and young adults, 9 to 18 years, 1,300 milligram per day. Men and women, 19 to 50 years old, at least a gram per day, which increases to 1.2 gram per day in men and women, 51 years and older. Looking at the elemental calcium con content of various oral calcium uh, preparations, calcium citrate contains about... Uh, you know, 300 milligrams of elemental calcium. Calcium carbonate, about 400 milligram per gram. Right. 
here we're looking at the effect of parathyroid hormone treatment on bone microarchitecture, right? So on the left, in, uh, so these are uh, bone biopsy specimens from a 64-year-old woman, the same woman. A is before treatment of parathyroid hormone, and B is after treatment of parathyroid hormone. See the significant difference, right, in terms of uh, bone formation and mineralization. Here it's very porotic bone. Here it's much more stable, stronger. Okay, looking at prognosis complications, guys, low bone mass is the most important risk factor for predicting first fracture. Relative risk of fracture roughly doubles each standard deviation decrease in bone mineral density. Osteoporosis related hip fracture is associated with a 20% excess mortality in the year following the fracture. Half of women who suffer hip fracture spend some time in a nursing home. Treatment of osteoporosis with bisphosphonates results in a 30 to 50% reduction in risk of fractures depending on the site and prior fracture history. Patients on long-term glucocorticoids are at higher risk for osteoporosis and often need preventative therapy with bisphosphonates and yearly DEXA scans. Guys, coming back to our beautiful clinical case, just to rehash this out, we had a 50-year-old lady who comes to you, she wants to know about her risk for fracture from osteoporosis. She does have a positive family of uh, a history of osteoporosis in the mum, but her mum never had a fragility fracture. She herself has not had any fractures. She's wide, 20 pack year history of tobacco use, but she quit 10 years prior. At the age of 37, she had a total hysterectomy for endometriosis. She is lactose intolerant. She doesn't consume dairy. She currently takes calcium carbonate 500 milligrams daily. She is underweight and her BMI is 19. All of the following risk factors, with one exception, which is history of cigarette smoking, guys. So we outlined that there are multiple risk factors, some modifiable, some non-modifiable for osteoporotic bone fractures, but current cigarette smoking is a risk factor for osteoporosis later fracture, but a prior history of cigarette use is not. Okay, my friends, time to talk about the Bible. Today we're taking our reading from the book of First Peter. Chapter 3, verse 10 through 12. Whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. Wow! He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. I'm sure all of us would love life and we want to see good days. So the key to that is we must keep our tongues from evil and deceitful speech. We must turn from evil and pursue peace. Then the Lord will turn his face toward us and he will be attentive to our cry and our prayer. Amen. Guys, if you enjoyed this video, I encourage you to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you so much. These are my references. You can catch me on Facebook. Just search for Internal Medicine, Algorithms, and Mnemonics. I'm also on Instagram and on TikTok as well. Thank you so much. We're going to be covering some exciting topics coming up. Diabetic ketoacidosis and acute coronary syndromes. Ha ha ha. Take care.